Welcome to Esoteric Thoughts. Today we have two special guests with us. We have Naparsha Da, who you may have seen, who you probably will have seen on the channel before. And we also have Dr. Lena Einhorn. Uh, so for today's interview, Napar will be your host and Napar will be conducting this interview. Over to you, Napar. Thank you so much, so much Esoteric. I'm very excited to be here with both of you. Um, I will just say Dr. Einhorn for the intro, but I'm going to address our dear guest as Lena. I'm very excited to just to jump right in. We don't have a lot of time. So um, without further ado, because I'm gonna, we're gonna go into who you are, what you do in the interview. Uh, Lena, thank you for being here with us. Thank you so much, Nepal. Now, I know everyone always goes right into, okay, tell us about your book or what's this thing about Jesus? But I want you to let the audience first know a little bit about you personally. Um, you do have, uh, you have a, I know you have a film about your, your family experience um, with, with um, the, the Holocaust. So you do have some of your life out there. But for those who don't know, tell us about you as a, as a person and a little bit about your spiritual background and your spiritual journey before we get started on your research and your work. Okay, so my name is Lena Einhorn. Uh, by training, I, I live in Sweden. I lived in the States for nine years, so um, I've, been, I've been there. Um, uh, by training, I'm an MD, PhD, uh, but I left the field many, many years ago. Uh, I, I did research for about 13 years. In 1989, when I was living in the States, I, uh, I left medical research and went into television and I did it via medical television. So I was working at Lifetime Television in New York for a couple of years. And at that time they had medical programming on Sundays for doctors. So that was my route into television. So I was doing, and then after nine years in the States, I returned to Sweden. I kept doing television. Um, and in parallel, I started writing books so basically what i what i'm doing now i i'm more and i'm basically only writing books and 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 i'm doing some film work also but basically i'm writing books now so i left research many many years ago but with the pandemic um i I returned. I don't know if you can see my Zoom. It says Vietnamskops Forum COVID Nitton, which is really, I became an activist really, because Sweden had a very, very unusual, and I would use the word crazy strategy during the, I don't know if you know about this, but Sweden was unique in the world and we had very high death numbers in the first six months. So, um, so I became an activist and suddenly I rejoined, you know, medical sciences. We became an activist group. Uh, of scientists really in Sweden. So for the last two years, I've been doing a lot of, I've been going back a lot to that. Now, I guess I should talk a little bit about why I'm here, <laughs> about the stuff what, uh, that, that brings me to you, right? Well, you know, we're, I'm glad you did let us know about your, your medical background and um, that, that you are working as an activist. That's very important for us to know. Um, but. I want to ask you before I start, we start speaking about your book, A Shift in Time. Were you um, religious or were you raised in any type of spiritual belief system as, uh, you know, as so, a young woman, as a child? So, uh, so my, you know, my history, my family is Jewish. Uh, my parents were Holocaust survivors. They came after the war to Sweden in 1946, and I was born in Sweden. They lived their whole lives in Sweden. I am not a believer. So when I came to the, to the topic in the books, and I now have a new book in Sweden, it's only in Swedish so far. It has been translated, but not published in English. I'm doing the same thing as I did with the New Testament. I'm doing it with the Old Testament. So yeah. And it's, it's uh, so it's this exactly the same sort of journey. 
So uh, my approach, I'm a history buff, but because of my background, I, you know, I went to Hebrew school. So, you know, I sort of, I'm steeped in, in sort of the Bible from that, from that angle. And oh, when I was a kid, we had Christianity on, as a subject in school. Everybody had to study Christianity. You know, at some point they, they switched it to religion, religious studies. But when I was a kid, it was Christianity. So I was seeped in, in that too, not to the same extent, but at least, so I, I had both traditions in me from being a child, okay? But, you know, I, we were not religious, we were traditional, but uh, it was like there the whole time in the background. So that is my, that is my background. I love history. I absolutely adore history. I had a history teacher in, 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 uh, in high school who, I mean, I think it's the most fabulous journey you can make is in time, the journey backwards in time. I love it. And, 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 and both, or there are three books now, actually, the, the two books about the New Testament, the Jesus mystery, which came in 2006 and translated mm -hmm. into English in 2007 and, and the shift in time that came 2016. And then the, the recent book, which is, which is only published in Sweden uh, about the old Testament, they, uh, it, you know, I approach them as the most exciting history riddles you can imagine, because I've re I've come to realize that the Bible, and I don't think only the Bible, I think, you know, all those very early spiritual books that were written were really a combination of spirituality, religious thoughts, and history. It was their way of writing history, but the history is always secondary or rather submerged under the mm. religion because when they conflict, when they collide, the religion has to take precedence. And so you, when, you, when you're looking for the history, you have to look under the surface. Oh, well, perfect, because this is, we're uh, on esoteric thought. So we're going uh, beneath the surface here. <laughs> and um, speaking of you and your history and your right and your books, we're gonna, if you don't mind, I'd like to really focus on the very controversial an exciting uh, a shift in time. You uh, just briefly, I know we don't have a lot of time, but I just wanna get all these questions out. But can you just briefly let us know, um, you said you studied Christianity, you said you, you studied um, the Hebrew faith, your, your Jew, uh, Jewish background. What happened where you said, wait a minute, there's a discrepancy between the New Testament and these writings of Josephus, because with your book, just to let the audience know, um, you examined the New Testament and you found a lot of very unconventional uh, discoveries. So let's start with you and the discrepancies that you found between Josephus, his accounts of history and the actual New Testament. Okay, so if, if you want me to take it from the beginning, can you give me like five minutes? Of course. Okay, of course. because you, then, you, then, then, then I'll tell you how I arrived at this. So I was doing some documentary for television and I guess something, this was in 2005. And no, let's start from the beginning. So in the early 80s, <laughs> we're talking 40 years ago, uh, I'm sitting at the dinner and somebody says to me, you know, Jesus didn't die on the cross. And, you know, as I said, you know, I, I'd studied Christianity in school. It was that, and the thought just went like, wham, bam, 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 bam. You know, sometimes somebody says something and it goes like in a microsecond, you start getting, oh my God, that makes sense. You know, he came down from the cross. He showed himself. And the Roman uh, Pontius Pilate washed his hands. You know, yeah, it makes sense. And then, oh, what did, so what really happened? Oh, so he must, 
the, the, the Romans didn't want to kill him, so they made a deal with him. So he left the country. He, they would take him down if he left the country. And wham, bam, bam, bam. You know, this is how it went, like, in less than a second in my head. I just thought, wow, that's intriguing. Now, I didn't know then, but of course, since then, I've, there are many books written with a, this hypothesis that he didn't die on the cross. I mean, you know, this, is, this isn't the first, but I didn't know about it. In any event, so the next thing, maybe a few minutes later, that, that hits me then, we're talking early 80s, is, okay, so he was like 31, 33. He left the country. So did he just retire? You know, this is a major preacher with great aspirations. One would have, even if one looks at it historically and not religiously, obviously a person was influential, especially if he was in the trial with the highest dignitaries of, of the empire. Did he just retire? And then the thought hit me, you know, when did Paul show up? And, and, uh, and I realized, well, Paul showed up in, outside on the road to Damascus around the time of Jesus' crucifixion or shortly thereafter, according to the chronology. And so I thought, could they be the same person? And this was like, this was like a thought at a dinner and that was it. I left it, you know, I, it was just that dinner. I didn't do anything with it. I did one thing with it, but then I sort of just left it. 25 years later, I'm, I'm at, it must have been some project that fell through or something. I had nothing on my list in my pipeline. I'm standing at the, in a bookstore in Sweden, in Stockholm. I'm looking up and I'm at the religion section and it's the New Testament. And I just decide then and there, I'm going to explore this. So I bought a bunch of books. <laughs> And I started exploring, okay, could they be the same guy? You know, it was like, I, it was just for fun. But how did I approach it? I approached it, I approached it by looking at the historical sources. And the most important historical source from that era of that realm, without any comparison, is Josephus, Josephus Slavius who was a Roman Jewish uh, uh, historian, an aristocrat, who wrote about the Jewish war, who wrote about Jewish history, and he did it after the Jewish war when everybody thought it was the end of the Jewish people. It was the end. And so he took it all down and he is our main historical source of that realm. He's uncompared, nobody compares with anything but Josephus, basically. There are a few little sources outside, but it's really Josephus is the comparison that you make with the New Testament, because the New Testament is also a historical source, right? It names all these, you know, emperors and, and high priests and, and, and tetrarchs and kings. And so they're all there in the New Testament and, and they're all there in Josephus, okay? So that's how I approached the issue. I started comparing them. And very soon I ran into problems. And this is a problem for anybody doing historical Jesus research. Outside of the New Testament, there are no parallels. The names are there. The, the names of the high priests, the names of the Roman procurators, the names of the emperors and kings and everything, they're all there but they don't do the same thing. And you don't find Jesus there, not before the second century when you start getting texts about Jesus. But from that time, from the first century, you don't find Jesus, you don't find his disciples. And this is the problem for all, all historical Jesus uh, scientists, scholars. So what is the common conclusion of this? There are two main trains of thought. The first one, the main one is, well, he was a Messianic Jewish leader in the time of the Romans before the Jewish war, but he was not better known than all the other ones. And, and, and Josephus names, you know, a bunch of them. 
And the less common thought is he didn't exist at all. So those are the two main thoughts. I mean, everybody has to tackle this issue that you don't find him in the history books. So they tackle it by either saying he was not well known in his own time, he became better known later, or he didn't exist at all. But what I started finding when I was comparing the New Testament and Josephus was that, hey, there's a bunch of stuff here that is common, but it's, the time is wrong. The time is wrong. So take the issue of robbers, okay? So Jesus is crucified with two robbers, right? And there's a lot of talk of robbers in the New Testament. Barabbas was a robber. The, the word robbers appears many times. When you look at Josephus, you find that he talks about the robbers a lot. And, and the robbers are rebels, the rebels against Rome. They, were, they called them robbers because, hey, they did a lot of stuff, those rebels. So they were called robbers in Greek, lestai. But the funny thing is, that when Josephus describes the robbers, they are there from the time the Romans occupy the Jewish realm until the year 6 AD, uh, when there is an uprising with, by a guy named Judas the Galilean. Then he does not mention the robbers one single time until the late 40s, when they reappear. And then, you know, they swarm the the realm and then starts the Jewish war in the year 66 and and the Jewish realm is destroyed by the Romans in the year 70 they hold out in some places a little longer but in those years between 6 and 44 or really 48 you do not see the word robbers one single time and when did Jesus exist according to the New Testament well he supposedly was born in the year one, or depending on which source you look at, a few years before then or a few years after that, but basically that's it. And he was crucified under the time of Pilate, okay, and Caiaphas, the high priest Caiaphas. And we know when that is because that's how chronology is described in, in uh, ancient times by the names of dignitaries. So Pilate was the Roman prefect the leader of Judea until the year 36. So he must have been crucified no later than 36, but there were no robbers then, right? According to Josephus. So, you know, but the thing is this kept happening when I was comparing them. It happened with a lot of things. There were no crucifixions at that time. There, there, there was no animosity between Samaritans and Jews at that time. It came later. And, and, you know, in this time, this chronological, and usually it was 15 to 20 years later that all these things happened. And that's, that was the, but I kept ignoring it. Like everybody else, you, you know, when you read something, this is, this is the issue of science overall. And this applies to scientists overall. This is a common, we all have preconceived notions. We all have our ideas. When things don't fit, we discard them. That's how the human mind functions. We discard them. So I discarded it until one late night. And, and I'm going to stop there um, because uh, I'm sure you, you have some more questions before we get to the person I think was Jesus. Well, yeah, that's wonderful. You gave us a lot. So let me, let me unpack some of this. So, okay. First of all, because I, I noticed that you, you really give a lot of credibility uh, and, and not just you, mainstream uh, uh, researchers give a lot of credibility to Josephus and his account. Um, how are you, um, well, how did you determine, okay, this timeline with Josephus is um, more reliable than the actual timeline that is in the uh, Bible? I know you touched on some of it, but could you just get more detailed about that? Why Josephus, why is his timeline, um, the timeline that you say, okay, this is the, this is the way I think it should be. It should be later on in like the fifties, you said, right? The fifties, like the forties or. Well, when we get to the point, yeah, when, 
when we get to the issue of who was Jesus, in if you uh -huh. look at, at Josephus's text, we we haven't talked about that yet. But as a rule, Josephus, there are for sure problems with Josephus. When they have done archaeology based on his texts, they find that he exaggerates numbers, he exaggerates sizes. You know, he, he says about the Jews being, you know, I don't know how many, and then you see, no, they couldn't have been that many, and maybe think, but he is generally reliable. If he says, this is where they built the, the, the palaces of Herod, then you dig and there is the palace of Herod, okay? I mean, so he is overall reliable. With exaggerations, you have to remember, he was a fighter in the war against Rome and he, and he became a turncoat and he became, and he joined the Romans, okay? So he has a lot of justification issues, for sure. Mm -hmm. But as a historical source, he's generally reliable. But moreover, he's the only thing we have. He's the only thing we have. I mean, you can look at Tacitus and you can look at Suetonius and you can look at some of the Roman sources. I mean, you know, this is, it's nothing compared to Josephus. Josephus wrote four major works out of, out of which two are really relevant to this. One is the Jewish war, which is not one book, but seven. You, the other one is Jewish antiquities, which is 20 books. I mean, it's massive amounts of texts. So right. can, can, you can I jump in and ask you? Yeah. I don't mean to interrupt you. No, when you okay. speak about his writings, Jewish antiquities, I believe, correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, does he not speak about Jesus specifically in, in, that, in that writing or no? Okay. So now we, uh, good. So now we are approaching the one thing that people hang their hat on. And it's okay. generally called Testimonium Flavianum. Okay. It's a paragraph in Jewish antiquities that suddenly speaks of Jesus as, you know, almost in reverential terms. Mm -hmm. I would say no scholars consider this as the original text. I mean, there may be single scholars, but those who wanna be kind, they say it's been changed. Those who are more dismissive say it's been added later. And there are many reasons for this. One is this reverential tone. I mean, Josephus hated the rebels and he hated the messianic leaders, okay? And this is suddenly he describes him as a God, you know? But the other thing is that it's, it's placement. It's in the middle of two paragraphs that are obviously joined together. And suddenly they're split by this paragraph. And there, there are other arguments. For instance, you don't find Jesus in the earlier Christ, uh, Christian church fathers text. There is no reference to this paragraph. But when you look at later church fathers text, there are references to this paragraph. So this implies that it was not there from the beginning, but it was added probably maybe in the fourth century AD. So you may find, I mean, you'll find some scholars to say, listen, it was there, but it's been changed. I, I, you find very few scholars who are gonna say, this is an original Josephus text. Uh, there, it, it, the same goes for uh, John the Baptist, but because there's a paragraph also about John the Baptist and there more people are inclined to look upon it as, as authentic. But there's disagreement also there. Oh, thank you. Speaking of um, early church fathers, you made me think of another question I wanted to ask you. Um, give us what you, the, the accounts of Polycarp and Arrhenius, like uh, the ones who say, okay, we have a connection with John the Baptist and you, I, I'm not John the Baptist, John, excuse me, John the Revelator. And then we know John the Revelator was associated with Jesus. Well, how do you speak to us on that? How do you resolve that in your research? No, he, 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 and here we're getting closer now to my hypothesis because uh, Arrhenius really says he seems to be alive much later than, than uh, I don't have the quote exactly here, but it is one of the things that's really noteworthy that, that he, you know, uh, that when they talk to John, it seems like Jesus is alive later than he would be al alive according to the 
to the New Testament. You have to find the quote to, 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 to quote it exactly, but it is, it's certainly one of those strange quotes. And I think, I think because I am a believer that Jesus really did exist. So I think we should get to the point. I really, we really have to get to that point of where- No, go is, ahead. Okay. It's all you. I don't want to interrupt. Just, <laughs> okay, I just jumped so, in with when you said- No, that's, uh, that's good. No, it's good because, yeah. because- Go ahead. I really do believe G Josephus writes about Jesus, okay? okay? I really do believe he does, but he doesn't call him Jesus, okay? So, okay, so what happened? Should we get the drum roll? Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay. What does so, he call him? What does he call him, Lena? The Egyptian. The All Egyptian. right, so let's get into that. <laughs> That's what everybody's here for. Let's just, let's just face it, okay? <laughs> That's okay. what we're all here for. Okay, okay go ahead. So okay. Lily, talk to us about this. This is fascinating. So it's very unconventional. I'll hand it over to you and I will zip my lips for about like, five <laughs> No, you can, you can interrupt me. You're free to interrupt me. Uh, okay, so remember I said all these things I put aside like you do, you know, and I'm a scientist by training. You, you know, when something doesn't fit, the thing you should do is stop and think. But that's not what people do. They dismiss. This is, you know, look at the Russians watching Russian television now. If something doesn't fit uh, what Putin says, they dismiss it. This is how the human mind works. So I dismissed all these things that were, hey, why are the robbers coming up at the late 40s when they should be there in the year 36? Why were there no crucifixions? Why is this guy Theodos mentioned? in the 40s in, in, in Josephus, but in the 30s in, in, uh, in uh, the New Testament, you know, they, they, they kept heaping up all these, you know, all these time shifts that were really, really strange. In any event, there was one guy. So I told you that Josephus talks about a lot of messianic le leaders and the messianic leaders are rebels because this is the era when the Jews rebel against the Roman Empire, because they've been occupied, right? And the rebellion is always led by religious figures. It is the, it's a religious and a physical rebellion. So the messianic leaders are always rebel leaders and vice versa, most often. It, it goes together, it's they're fighting for the religion. So he says, you know, the all these messianic, but he names a few. He names a few, just a handful. And one of the ones he names is called the Egyptian. And let me just read, he writes about him at length and he writes about him in both his major works, the Jewish war and Jewish antiquities. And I'll just read one of them, okay? And you, and you, <laughs> uh, let me just find it. Um, Okay. And yeah. while you look for that, I no, just I wanted it. to. Okay. Oh, you found it. Great. All right. right. Okay. So this is what Josephus writes about the Egyptian. And the Egyptian appears under procurator, not Pilate, but Felix. And Felix was the procurator between 52 and 59 AD, approximately. So, you know, 20 years after after Jesus was said to be crucified, okay? So this is one of his texts. I quote, there came out of Egypt about this time to Jerusalem, one that said he was a prophet and advised the multitude of the common people to go along with him to the Mount of Olives, as it was called, which lay over against the city and at the distance of five furlongs. He said further that he would show them from hence how, at his command, the walls of Jerusalem would fall down, and he promised them that he would procure them an entrance into the city through those walls when they were fallen down. Now, when Felix was informed of these things, he ordered his soldiers to take their weapons and came against them with a great number of horsemen and footmen from Jerusalem and attacked the Egyptian and the people that were with him. He also slew 400 of them and took 200 alive, but the Egyptian himself escaped out of the fight 
but did not appear anymore. Now, if this had been written about an event in the 30s, I mean, we would, you know, our ears would <laughs> prick up because there are a lot of similarities here, like, like Jesus, and there's his other text also talks about Jesus. It's, a, it's much more negative, the, the other text he writes, and he writes about him coming in from the wilderness there. So like Jesus, the Egyptian had lingered in the wilderness. Both speak of tearing down the walls of Jerusalem in Luke, you read this. Both had lived in Egypt. Both are described as messianic leaders with a great following. Both are perceived as major threats by the authorities. And the Egyptian is defeated on the Mount of Olives, which is where Jesus was arrested, right? Now, there are three major differences between them. The first one is the time, okay? But if we look upon this time issue as, hey, there's a lot of stuff that seems to be different in time. So we can put that aside for the time being. The second difference is, Okay, Jesus was resting on the Mount of Olives and, and the Sanhedrin, the, the people from the Jewish council came and arrested this resting man, right? And here there's a battle with the Roman uh, commander sending out soldiers. And, you know, so it's, it's a diff and the third thing is there's not, no word of crucifixion, okay? So those are the three differences. But what happened after I'd read about this guy, you know, I kept thinking, oh my God, he does something, but it's the wrong time. So I had this science revelation moment that, you know, when you stop putting things aside and it just comes back and just whams you <laughs> into your head. It was late at night, it was like three o'clock in the morning and I was reading a translation. I don't speak Greek, but I was re reading a, an, let's say an accurate translation of the original text of John describing the arrest of Jesus, okay? And there is a difference between the synoptic gospels, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John when it comes to the description of the arrest of Jesus. Because the synoptic gospels all describe how the, the Jewish council, the men from the Jewish council came and ar arrested him, right? John says that the men from the Jewish council were accompanied by the commander and his, depending on which translation, his soldiers, his, his guardsmen. He, there were some Romans there also. But when you look at the original Greek of John, the word for those soldiers, those guardsmen, is spera, and the word for the commander is chiliarkos. Espera is a Roman cohort of 1,000 soldiers. 1,000. And, and, and chiliarkos means a leader of 1,000. This was not a few men. It was a battle, right? So when I realized that, that Jesus, according to John, was in a battle on the Mount of Olives, I, you know, it just went holy <laughs> can i ask you something i'm going to jump in because yeah. I, I remember this really stuck with me um when i was doing when i was listening to um your information um have you ever been asked okay well what about um jesus when you go to that scripture and if you don't mind i'm just gonna go to i think it's matthew Oh, no, it's John. You're talking John. about John 18. Yeah. Okay. What, if you don't mind me, can I just read it? Sure. And then, it's it's 18.3 okay. and 18.12. I think there are two places. You're right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I'll do 18.3. So Judas then having received a band of men, that's what you're saying, which is a, is a group of the thousand, right? Yeah. And, uh, uh, and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees coming there with lanterns and torches and weapons. And then verse 12 is, then the band and the captain and officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him. Now, what about when Jesus says, because uh, I, I was very intrigued by what you mentioned, when this is all going on and then Peter, what you said, cuts the ear off. When Jesus stops him in the story, in the narrative of the story, yeah, I, I, I know you're gonna, so I wanna give it, because you know, people have these questions. So then he says, no, don't do it, because I can call down 
legions to fight for me, but this isn't what we're supposed to do. So can you talk to us about that? Right. Um, okay. I'm just going to say one other thing that in Luke, it actually, Jesus is telling them to bring swords to the Mount of Olives. Right. Right. Yes. He's telling them to bring swords and sell their cloaks unless they have swords. I find now that I'm looking at it through this lens, I find the New Testament to be one of the most intriguing, elaborate mazes, labyrinths. It's, it's amazingly cleverly written. Amazing. This is not the only time when Jesus says the opposite of what he, if Josephus is correct, and this is the same person would say there are other places where the story is almost the same, but instead of saying, okay, cut them down, he says, no, put down your swords. So, and this comes several, it's the same. I mean, there's several places like this where, where people are doing one thing. If you look at it through the lens of Josephus, and Jesus says the opposite. Now, I have, I have to, you know, this makes me need to, to uh, address the issue of why would you shift it in time at all? Because we have to get to that eventually. So why would anybody want it? If this is, an, if this is a real shift in time that is done in the New Testament from the 50s to the 30s. And, and I just want to tell you, it's not like there's one thing. It's not like there's two things. It's like when you look at it in the 30s, there is not one single parallel. There are names, but they don't do the same things. It's not, there's not one single parallel. If you move it to the 50s, it's a slew of parallels, but with one significant difference. The parallels, if you look at them in Josephus, they're all violent. It's it's rebel activity. It's a fight with knives. If you look at the same texts, when you look at these parallels, if you accept them as parallels and you look at them in the New Testament, they're mostly, but not all the time, pacifistic. So not all the time, because the New Testament lets through these bursts, like when Jesus tells the disciples to bring swords. Why would he tell them to bring swords to the Mount of Olives? And and he, you know, and there and another thing is the New Testament names every single first century rebel leader for what for no reason whatsoever. They just throw the names in. So I rem remember what I said that when history and religion collides, his, uh, religion wins, but the true history is always under the surface. Okay. And why would they move it from the 50s to the 30s? There, I can, if this is true, which I believe it is, I can think of only one single reason. And that is that Josephus, and there were other historians that we don't no longer have, like Justice of Tiberius. But Josephus, he was not a small, insignificant guy. He was really important in his own time. He was brought by... Emperor Titus to Rome, his books were published and uh, 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 deposited in the library of Rome. He had a, even a statue erected to him. If you were going to describe the same people as Josephus was describing, you'd have to compete with him. And he does not like these people, okay? Okay. okay. He does not may, like may these ask, people. Right, you did mention that. Let me ask you a question. Um, I don't know if I'm the first one asking you this. Uh, the Egyptian, could it be possible because of the time which would fit with Simon the Mag Magus uh, or, or what did you say? You said, the, you, you mentioned Theodos. Could it be possible that the Egyptian could also be compared to Simon, Simon Magus because he also was a leader? And did you ever consider that other people besides Jesus could be, have you ever besides been asked that? Could be, besides the Egyptian. Yeah. yeah, I mean, a lot of people have compared the Jesus of, because he doesn't exist, you know, as is in Josephus. It, 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 people have compared him to a lot of different uh, 
individuals, there's, uh, there's, you know, a number of them, and I'm not the only one who's using a shift in time uh, idea. But why, Jesus? I am, like, I, am, I, am I am, I am, I am, I am looking at all of you. One yeah. second. Did you, did you look at Simon Magus? I did. I did. I did. I did. I did. I mean, the, not the Jesus, the Egyptian. Tell us about that. Like, no, no, but listen, it, I, I'm, I'm not, you know, it's a long time ago that I wrote about it. And it's a long time ago that I looked at Simon Magus. I did look at it, but you would have to remind me of, of, of where you see the similarities for me to address it. Uh, okay, well, what, like, for instance, he was also, he heard the story of Jesus from the apostles. He followed Philip. Um, he followed him most, Phil, you know, there were the gospels of Philip found in the Nakamadi. So Philip was in Egypt. He, he was a disciple of Philip and he also died. He was around in, in first century, like 50, uh, from like 40 to 54. Um, he, he was a God. He led a great group of men. Um, so I just, those little things, because I really love the idea, but then I started thinking, well, possibly could could this be any not just simon but there were many disciples who loved this idea of jesus and they just started you know maybe picking up whatever speed or steam and talk to us about that possibility okay, okay so this is my reading in general that josephus is not doing quizzes he's not doing riddles but the new testament is and so sometimes in the New Testament, one person appears as several different people. So for instance, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Christ may well be the same person. It, when, you, when you look at, again, when you look at the historical sources, there are indications they, they may be the same person. I'll give you another example. Remember that the third thing that differentiates the Egyptian from Jesus is that he wasn't crucified according, or there's no mention of him being crucified in Josephus, okay? Now, when Jesus is crucified, remember the story of what, what happens, okay? So there's a choice. He's crucified between two robbers, but there's a robber leader, a rebel leader, who's also, supposed to be crucified by Rabbas, right? But he, he is like, they say, should we crucify Barabbas or should we crucify Jesus? And Je they choose Jesus. So Jesus is crucified and Barabbas escapes without being crucified, right? Now, what does Barabbas mean? It means Bar son Abbas, son of the father, right? Now in Matthew, what is Barabbas called? Jesus Barabbas. So they say, so the question is, should we crucify Jesus or should we crucify Jesus, son of the father? Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. So, so yeah. here you have the riddle again. Okay. Mm -hmm. Of course he could be a separate person, but it is a little weird that he's called, that his name right. is Jesus, son of the father. Okay. So yeah, there's, yes. There's something to that, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So I do think that the, the, the New Testament is written like a quiz. And so I do think the same person does appear as several different people. And it, do, it, it may well be, I'm not read up on Simon Magus right now. So I can't, you know, I can't discuss it with you be, because you may, I remember reading it and thinking, no, there are too many differences, but I'm, you know, I don't remember now. So it, it may well be that there are similarities, but I want to bring up another one. Um, because it's so cleverly written. And, and that night when I read this wham thing that, that came in and you know, that there was a whole army meeting, meeting, the Egypt, uh, meeting Jesus on, on the Mount of Olives, the one thing that's just got into my head and scared the hell out of me, frankly, was uh, Acts 21 verse 38. Okay. Because remember what led me into this was, could Jesus and Paul be the same person? Right. Okay. Now the Egyptian, 
like all the rebel leaders, are mentioned in the New Testament. They're named. Mm -hmm. All the major rebel leaders are there from the first oh. century. The and Egyptian so is in the, the, let's see. The, oh, really? Tell us what, where, where is the Egyptian? Uh, let me, let me uh, I think I can maybe find it here and I'll read it to you Thank exactly. You. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Because I was looking for something in there. Um, I didn't see anything. I okay. Don't know, um, okay. Yeah. I'm going to read you a section. This is, this is, I'll read it, you know, it'll take a minute, but this is Acts of the Apostles, chapter 21. Paul, who, you know, made, got his revelation on the road to Damascus, I, he, he, he comes back to Jerusalem a few times, but he's really not welcomed there, right? They really tried mm -hmm. to <laughs> get him out of there. And and then he decides to show himself in the temple, okay? He comes several times and then he, one time he goes there for the last time and he goes to the temple. And remember, this is, this is, you know, some time after the crucifixion of Jesus, obviously. So I'm gonna read to you, Acts. The whole city was in a turmoil and people came running from all directions. They seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple. And at once the doors were shut. They were bent on killing him. I mean, why? Why would they kill him? So they, they are really angry. The people at the temple are really angry at Paul. Why would they be so angry? So they were bent on killing him. But word came to the officer commanding the cohort that all Jerusalem was in an uproar because of Paul, right? He immediately took a force, uh, the commander immediately took a force of soldiers with their centurions and came down at the double to deal with the riot. When the crowd saw the commandant and his troops, they stopped beating Paul. As soon as the commandant could reach Paul, he arrested him and ordered him to be shackled with two chains. He inquired who he was and what he had been doing. Some in the crowd shouted one thing, some another. And as the commander could not get at the truth because of the hubbub, he ordered him to be taken to the barracks. When Paul reached the steps, he found himself carried up by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob. For the whole crowd was at their heels yelling, kill him. Just before he was taken into the barracks, Paul said to the commandant, may I have a word with you? The commandant said, so you speak Greek? Are you then not the Egyptian? who some time ago created turmoil and together with the 4,000 Sicarii went out into the wilderness. So, so wouldn't that, that's very, I'm glad you showed he's me that. He's saying to Paul, remember he's reversing all the time, you know, are you then not the Egyptian? Meaning, no. are you that? That's what the, that's what the crowd told him, obviously. It's the Egyptian, kill him. Okay. So mm -hmm. so so they're saying Paul is the Egyptian. But because, would you huh? I don't want to interrupt, but I just want to ask you because I could and I'm just gonna jump in and out. But wouldn't that be closer to Simon Magus than Jesus himself? What wouldn't would be? that be more like though during that time was the time when Simon Magus comes on the scene? And Jesus is long gone. What I'm wondering is, because I, I, I mean, this is very intriguing. I, I just want to pick your brain on what what leads you to go to Jesus more than to go to someone like Simon Magus or who's actually mentioned in Acts and could possibly be this Egyptian, this notorious Egyptian mentioned of, right? What? Why would that be Jesus? No, I mean, the, the parallel that I draw to Jesus is the, is the stories from Josephus of, of him, of the, of the um, Egyptian coming to the Mount of Olives and, and fighting. And all the, I mean, that's the, that's the story that makes it so similar to Jesus, right? Okay. So, so, I mean, yeah. 
I, that is, that's, that's sort of, you know, we've already established the similarities between the Egyptian and Jesus, but we have not. Now, remember, I came to this with a thought, could Jesus and Paul be the same person? But what is so clever here is that they bypass Jesus and makes the connection between, between the Egyptian and Paul, because if they had said, are you then not Jesus, then Jesus would have been Paul, right? So they say, <laughs> that would are be- you then not the Egyptian? So That would have worked for all of us, right? <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Do you think that Jesus, um, according to the story, if he's Egyptian and, and um, he is the Egyptian, would he still be considered the Messiah that everyone uh, uh, calls, says he is? Or Because I know I did hear a, a little bit of your teaching and what you write in the book about it's um you refer to origin, I think. Yeah. Correct me if I'm. Speak to us about Jesus and his Messiah. Uh, if he if he is the Egyptian, is he the Messiah still? Okay. So this is an interesting issue because I am not a mythicist. Now the traditional scholars, they sort of, as I said, they say, "Hey, Jesus was not known in his own time, or he was one of the minor messianic leaders." That's why we don't read about him in the historical sources. The mythicist says he's completely invented. I don't say that. I say he was a historical person and he was well known. He was well known. He was major. Now, remember that Josephus hates the rebels. And he has turned, he's a turncoat. He's sided with the Romans. He is, but he's faithful to his Jewish heritage. That's why he wrote all those books to preserve the Jews. But he's not faithful to the Jewish war, which was not all rebels, but the rebels were, you know, he, he's really dismissive of the rebels. So we cannot trust Josephus's description of the rebels because he hates them, okay? I don't, I don't make any sort of pronouncements <laughs> at all about the Egyptian being a godly figure or not. Obviously he was a religious leader because all the rebel leaders were religious, okay? Obviously he was a messianic religious leader, no doubt. If he could be, and unlike both the mythicists and the traditional scholars, I say, hey, Jesus was a major guy. I don't, I don't make any pronouncements about whether he could be the Messiah or not. Okay. But you say he's real. He was real. I say real, he's real. real. I say he's real. Okay. Speak to us about you. You do go into the parents of Jesus. Talk to us more about what you found out from origin, the information that you uncovered. Okay. So the interesting thing is that. This- oh, I'm sorry, ma'am. Not, not Jesus, the Egyptian. I almost. <laughs> No, no, the, the no Jesus, no Jesus, Jesus. Really. No, y'all almost got me. <laughs> no, no. Let's let's look at how Jesus is described by okay. different sources. And remember, there's nothing written about Jesus uh, like Jesus, not like the Egyptian, but like Jesus before the second century. But then the texts start coming. Okay, and one of the early texts is written by an anti-Christian Greek man called Celsus. Yeah. And the reason we know, he wrote in 180, about 175 AD. So the reason we know about it is that he w- it's so historically written that Origen, who was an early church father, quotes it. And that's why it's preserved, okay? And Origen quotes it in order to defute it to refute it, to dismiss it, but he quotes it at length. And it's early text, okay? So, and it's it's not religious at all, it's rather anti-religious. And in this, Celsus says that Jesus, and he says clearly Jesus, was the son of a poor, Jewish woman and a Roman soldier by the name of Pantera. He was so poor 
that he went to Egypt to make a living. And he came back from Egypt to the Holy Land or whatever you want to call it, the Jewish realm, as an adult, not as a child, as an adult with knowledge of magical thinking. And then he dismisses this magical thinking because he's anti-Christian. But this is his description of Jesus, that he went as an adult to Egypt, not as a child, as Matthew says. Now you have the Talmud, which also talks about the man they called Ben Pantera, which is the son of Pantera, which was the name of that <laughs> Roman soldier, according to Celsus, who also comes as an adult from Egypt with magical thinking. So it's they say the same. The Talmud is later, it's like fifth, sixth century, which is Jewish text, right? But then you have some Christian texts that also make the link between Jesus and the Egyptian. And you have a ninth century text by a bishop of Lyon. His name is Amulo. He writes in, nine, in the ninth century a book called Letter or Book against the Jews to King Charles, where he stated that the following was the name that the Jews gave to Jesus. Quote, in their own language, they call him Usum Hamitsri, which is to say in Latin, Dissipator Egyptius, the Egyptian destroyer. And in the Sefer Toldot Yeshu, which is really a caricature of, of the gospels, it's also a negative text, it's a later text. It says the name of Jesus' father in this book is said to be the Egyptian because he did the work of the Egyptians. And there are other Christian sources that also mention that the Jews refer to Jesus as the Egyptian. So, so it's, and, and finally, uh, the final thing is, of course, that in Matthew, it says that Jesus returned from Egypt with his parents when he was a child after the death of Herod the Great, right? But mm -hmm. the next sentence right after this, right after his description of returning from Egypt as a child, it says, at that time, John the Baptist started preaching in the wilderness. Now, John the Baptist and Jesus are the same age. How could Jesus have returned as a child if John the Baptist starts preaching at the same time? So here you have the whole thing that I talked about in the beginning, like if they change it from the 50s to the 30s, do they do it retroactively or do they do it from the beginning when they write the gospels? And I think in some cases they did it retroactively, like in Matthew, which is earlier, earlier writing. And because it becomes, you know, because they only change the names of dignitaries, that's how you make chronology in, 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 in the Bible through names of dignitaries. So they just changed the name of a dignitary after the death of Herod the Great. It might have been after the death of Herod Agrippa. Then you move it in time. But if you don't make other changes, it becomes illogical. And here you have an illogical thing. Jesus returns as a child at the same time as John the Baptist start preaching, which is impossible. Right. I, thank you. I want to go back to your, your uh, mentioning of the crucifixion. Um, where is the information that you uh, draw from where you say there was a space of time where there were no documented crucifixions? Because according to history, crucifixions were going on, uh, you know, and they were outlawed. Maybe I think Constantine outlawed them after uh, the fourth century. So where do you see that? Because you mentioned, talk to us about, you say there's this space of time that you find there's no crucifixions, but I don't, I, I on my end, I didn't understand that because crucifixions oh, I'm were not going saying, on the No, I'm not saying there are no crucifixion. What I'm saying is that, that uh, Josephus does not name one single crucifixion uh, between, I, I think it is uh, four, and 40, uh, uh, 46 CE, I keep saying oh. CE. So, okay. so, um, so there could have been crucifixion, but remember, uh, uh, Tacitus says under T Tiberius, all was quiet. There was no rebellion. There was no robbers. There were probably no reason to crucify them because crucifixions was a very, you know, this, you didn't crucify anybody. You didn't crucify someone for stealing. You crucify someone for high treason, you know? And so this was a quiet era between six 
and 48 was a quiet era. And he, if there were crucifixions, he does not mention them. The only place right. he mentions a crucifixion between the time is in the, is in the, is in the testimony of Flavianum, which is this uh, Jesus uh, sec, uh, paragraph. Um, I don't know. I, I, I'm, thank you for clarifying all of this very intriguing information. Can, can I, I say know one? Much, can I say one you more thing? You can say everything. Get it all out because I okay. want everyone to get your book and check out a shift in time. Um, you know, take a look at all of Dr. Lena Einhorn research. <laughs> okay, so, so, okay, so then a question that of course appears is, okay, so, okay, so Jesus is in the 50s, uh, or if he is the Egyptian, he would be, what about John the Baptist, okay? Now, as I mentioned, there is a paragraph about John the Baptist also in Antiquities by Josephus. More people are prepared to, to call this genuine. Some people don't. I don't think it is. But in any event, in line with my previous thinking, it doesn't mean that I don't think that John the Baptist is mentioned, right? Now, as I said, Josephus names only a handful of messianic leaders in the first century. He says there are lots of them, but he names only a few. The messianic leader he names before, the last one before the Egyptian is Theodos. And this is what he writes about Theodos, and I will quote Josephus. Now it came to pass while fathers was procurator of Judea, this is 45, 46. While Fadus was procurator of Judea, that a certain magician whose name was Theodos persuaded a great part of the people to take their effects with them and follow him to the river Jordan. For he told them he was a prophet and that he would by his own command divide the river and afford them an easy passage over it. And many were deluded by his words. However, fathers did not permit them to make any advantage of his wild attempt, but sent a troop of horsemen out against them, who falling upon them unexpectedly slew many of them and took many of them alive. They also took Theodos alive and cut off his head and carried it to Jerusalem. That's the last messianic leader named by Josephus before the Egyptian. Now, if he hadn't been called Theodos, but John the Baptist, that would, be the, that would have been that, it, right? Yes, I'm listening. I, you, I feel like if I say Simon the Magus one more time, <laughs> you're going to jump you through have, the you screen. Have to, you have to read, you have to read. <laughs> Theodos is connected to Philip and John the Baptist. And so, but you know what? I love, it gets my wheels turning. This, no one can deny that this is what this book is about. Get, take a look at it, read it. It gets you thinking, wait a minute. Something's, we got to find out. We got to sort this out here. So I appreciate it. But I'm just throwing that out to you. You're going to go look at the I Simon did read. Magazine. Listen, I, I went back to Simon Magus. Listen, it's it, it, many years since I wrote the book. I went back to Simon Magus several times and it didn't click. Um, okay. But it, it doesn't mean that, I mean, it may well be because as I said, the, it is written like a, like a riddle, the, the New Testament. And so the same person does appear under several names. I mentioned the Jesus, son of the father, Barabbas and Jesus, right? I mean, and, and yeah. Mary Magdalene and, and, and Mary. And it, it, it is a way of writing that, that people turn up in the, it's, it's incredibly intricately written. It's amazing. So I'm not denying that Simon Magus has with this story. Do I just couldn't, um, I just couldn't, it, it, it wouldn't disturb me at all if it did. But I, 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 it didn't click for me. But maybe, I mean, you can persuade me afterwards, perhaps. You know what's going to happen? You're going to go write a book on Simon Magus now. <laughs> and 
I want to be the one who I'm your the one who pushed you to that. So, no, I really, um, I really, and and I and I started reading up on Philip, and I it it just I couldn't I couldn't, but it it may well be that I've missed something. May well be. Well, you know, do, uh, I want to say, Doctor Lena, <laughs> you know, people when we read these texts, we are looking for you know. Some people say, oh, it's a myth. You you are like, no, this is a real person. What we're when we pick up the Bible, we're looking for the the truth most of the time. So I want you to, I mean, we we went into all your research and and your 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 what, what you found, but I want you to speak to us about the person who does read your book and go, light bulb, wow, yes, this is 100 percent truth. Where do they go from there? Like, should they say, you know, I'm not gonna believe that Jesus anymore? I mean, I'm not saying you have to dictate people's lives, but did you ever consider the ones sure. who, you know, sure. talk to us about I that. mean, yeah. sure. I mean, I would say like this, if Jesus and Paul is the same, that's a little more problematic because he's really tooting his own horn. It becomes a little <laughs> problematic. I mean, if, wow. Jesus, if, Jesus, if Jesus is the Egyptian, I don't see that as a problem. Now, okay. um, obviously it's a rebel leader. But anybody who wants to deny that Jesus was part of the rebellion is not doesn't know his or her history because, I mean, you know, it's very clear that 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 this was the time of rebellion. And he talks, you know, people getting swords. He's crucified next to robbers. I mean, you know, it is also in the New Testament there is a connection to the rebellion, obviously. But it doesn't, but he, but you know, the rebel leaders were messianic. They were. And so, I mean, you can be a rebel for a good cause and, 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 and liberating Judea and, and, and the Galilee from, from the Romans could definitely be construed as a good cause. I mean, they were occupied. I make no judgment whatsoever, and nor does anybody else, about whether the Egyptian was, uh, you know, a godly figure or not. Uh, I'm just looking at it as, as history. Uh, and if you read this and you find that it's convincing, I would just say, wow, he existed. Isn't that great? And, and you yeah. know... It, <laughs> and nobody even saw it, sees him dead in, in, in Josephus. They say he escaped out of the fight. Josephus doesn't even say he was, he died. So it doesn't sort of, it doesn't impinge on, on, on religion at all, I would say. Okay. Well, what about this? There is some uh, information out there that Jesus is not, uh, you, obviously, he's not, he's not Caucasian, he's Black. Would you say that if he's Egyptian, is he an African, uh, Black Egyptian? No, well, okay, if, if you judge by the uh, texts that are outside of uh, Josephus and the New Testament, you know, those ones that I was referring to you, uh, the, the one Celsus, and uh, it says that he actually right. came from the Jewish realm and went to Egypt. Okay. So, you know, if that is true, he, would, he was most likely from the Jewish realm. But... Uh, uh, if you go by Josephus, it doesn't say. It just says that he came out of Egypt. Wow. I want to talk to you some. We're going to take, that's a hot topic. We're going to leave that because I don't think we have a lot more time. And I want to touch on your movie that I absolutely just, it's touching. Your mo movie with your mother. Oh, you saw and it? I looked at, I didn't get to finish it, but I looked at some of it. And I looked at, I think that was a, a beautiful idea. I want you to talk to the audience about your um, your unconventional idea to actually have your mom narrating, may she rest in peace, and talk about her story for us. That's important to me for you to do that. Okay, my phone is humming here. Okay, uh, so my mother, her name was Nina, and my father, they came from Poland, uh, and they both survived uh, the Holocaust. And um, my mother was one of the very, very few survivors from the Warsaw Ghetto who had not escaped early, but was sat through the entirety of the Warsaw Ghetto. Just a few hundred people who survived who were there at the end of the Warsaw Ghetto. Um, 
Now, um, when the Warsaw Ghetto was destroyed during the uprising by the Germans, she managed to, and her brother also managed to, you know, just giving you the very sparse details, they managed to get out and hide in Warsaw until the end of the war. I mean, the Warsaw Ghetto was destroyed in 43, so for another year and a half. <clears throat> and um, they both came to Sweden after the war and they, it's, it's, they came as refugees because there was new anti-Semitism in Poland after the war and, and many, uh, they happened to be, they were both studying medicine and they were studying, happened to be studying in, in Denmark um, because, you know, there were no laboratories basically supplied in, in, in Poland. So they were there for the summer in Denmark when they heard about pogroms against Jews in Poland. And so they decided not to go home and they came to Sweden. Now, my mother, her whole life, she, she felt a need to tell her story, not least because of her brother who died before her. He was, he was uh, 11 years older because he really saved her during the war. And, uh, and she had this very strong need to tell her story, but she was not a writer and she never did. So she, she, um, she read, you know, she um, dictated some texts about it. It became quite a thick, just to have it, just so we should have it. And, and then uh, both she and my father became sick with cancer the day after each other in 99. And I decided immediately that I was gonna tell her story. I mean, I don't know why, it was like I took over her pledge. Um, and I, uh, I uh, made a, an interview with her and she was already sick then. I mean, if you look at it, she has a wig on. Uh, she was undergoing chemotherapy and uh, and uh, then I just you know both of them were very sick and and they died within uh, two and a half years and uh, it, it took some time you know she knew I was going to do something with it um, and she was there when I wrote the first script but then I couldn't finance it uh, it was like it went on for years I couldn't finance it um, but you know, I managed to convince her that I was going to do it. And then uh, finally, uh, when it couldn't be financed, uh, I wrote, started writing a book. And then like yes. halfway through the book, I got this uh, Polish uh, producer to take it on, and, you know, for no money. I mean, when nobody was paid and uh, it was amazing. It was no budget basically, but not because it wasn't well done because it was done in Poland with actors and everything. Uh, but, you know, everybody was doing it for, for cheap or for nothing. Uh, and I decided that I was going to use my mother as the narrator. And I'd never seen a film where an authentic interview is the narration. Right. I'd never seen that. I've seen, you know, films like, you know, uh, what do you call it? Green, Green Tomatoes, whatever it's called, or Titanic, where you have an old person sitting there, an actor telling, oh, when I was young, blah, 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 and you go back to when they were young. But I'd never seen it, I'd never seen it with the authentic person. And I didn't know if it would work because you don't talk the same way when you're interviewed and when you are acting, right? But I, I did it anyway. And when the first day, after the first day of shooting, I asked to go into a, uh, an editing room with my mother's interview and the first day of shooting and cut it together just to see if it would work. We had gone that far without knowing it. And I could see that it, that it did work. Um, and, and, uh, and I must say, you know, it was, uh, my mother never got to see it, but the, the book won the National Book Award of Sweden and the film won the National Film Award of Sweden. So, it's been hard to see it now for the last two years, but now the Swedish Film Institute um, renovated, uh, you know, the digital version of it, and it's going to within a few months, it's going to be accessible everywhere. Right, Nina's story, and Nina's it is journey. An Nina's journey. Nina's oh, journey. Oh, sorry, Nina's journey, and it's an excellent um, legacy for uh, for you to have for your mother. So, uh, Nina's journey, and there are. Uh, English subtitles. I think it. I think I got. I have to finish it, but it's a beautiful, beautiful piece. And 
it's a great thing that you did even even though your mother didn't get to see it it's there forever and it's a great it's a great story so you know what they um, even they even named the street after my mother now in Stockholm oh, and she awesome. was not you know my father was very well known uh, but my mother she was a doctor I mean she was not very well known and I know I know what what they would have what she would have said if if, if she had known, she would have looked in shock at us and she would have said, but well, what about my husband? <laughs> oh, that's so, that's so sweet. You are such a, I just want to let you know, you're very, um, I love your energy. You're a very intriguing person. Um, and this, this is a great, um, this is a great opportunity for everyone to get to know more about you as a person, not just about your unconventional, um, discoveries about the Egyptian, but just you. I, I love, I love your energy. You're, Thank you're you. very delightful. And Napa, Napa, you are making me go back to Simon Magus. I'll do it right away. I'll do it right away. <laughs> yes. I want you to, don't you see, I need to get the book. So I need to, I need to sit back and see, oh, there's the book uh, that uh, Lena did. And it's the answer to the Egyptian Simon Magus question mark. No. Okay, so um, we've been doing this for way over an hour, so I'm excited. I know I don't know if you you have more time or you thought before out of time. Esoteric has been sitting there, very stoic and very um, yes, this is going very well. We will find out who Jesus is. We will do this tonight today. So um, thank you so much. I don't thank you. I, I, love, I loved your interview. You were challenging me, and I like that because. Uh, <laughs> That's, I that's told cool. you ahead of time. Because you know why? Listen, it's because I, it could be that information is quite possible. And I know people have these questions. So I want you to be able to go, nope, you know, you just keep volleying them back to me. And I just, it's like tennis. So thank you. <laughs> I appreciate you. I appreciate you. So esoteric, now what do you want? Do you have anything to say? Um, no, that's been, that's been great. Uh, I'm not going to spoil it by adding too much. So all I will say is thank you, Lena, and uh, thank you, Nepal. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was, right. it was fun.